בוקר טוב, שבוע טוב. Our show today is dedicated as the rest of the series לעילוי נשמת משה רפאל בן אליהו. We are learning today about רב שמואל מוהליבר. So I have uh, some, I don't have, but I, I feel like I have a special connection to him because, mm-hmm. the, yes, the, the, the shul where I was davening during weekdays uh, was near to a school and in Nebrak and both were called Mohaliver and the street was called Mohaliver. Uh, so yeah, so for me, it was like the, the, the biggest rabbi when I was a kid, it was the biggest rabbi. Of course, everything is called up, named after him. Uh, and the street next to him in which uh, in, in which uh, my uh, maon, how do you say maon, like the child, uh, yes, kinder, no, no, beneath kindergarten, the daycare. Yeah, so it was called Nissenboim. It's a Nissenboim. Rabbi Yitzhak Nissenboim was the secretary of Rav Mohaliver. And, uh, and Pnina uh, lived in this street called Nissenboim. So yes, that's, uh, that's interesting. Uh, so so he, he looms large in, in my life of Shmuel Mo'aliver. But we will speak, of course, not about uh, the street in Nebrak, uh, but about uh, the men. So Rav Shmuel Mo'aliver was born in 1824, and he was Niftar in 1898. So again, a product of the 19th century, Russia, and he was born in uh, near Vilnius, In Lithuania, now I think, as I, I said many times, in the 19th century, there is no difference in Lithuania and Poland mm-hmm. and Belarus. All of these are part of the states that were annexed by Russia. So everything was Russia, but it was not Russia proper, in which, as we said many times, Jews were not allowed to reside, to live. But it was part of the pale of settlement in which Jews were allowed to live. Now, he was born in a very small state named Livokia. Obviously, I'm, I'm butchering the name. So, Livokia, uh, near Vilnius. His father was Rebuda Leib, and he was born to a family that was famous for their Torah learning, but they didn't take upon themselves mostly rabbinic position. So, they were uh, in favor of learning and working. Because they were genius enough in order to do both you, you need most of us if we hold to a traditional job at right, nine to five or nine to seven as it now these nowadays then it leaves very little room for serious Torah learning but if you're a real genius then you are able to do both you can walk uh, in uh, if you are an innovator then you can walk for a short period of time and make enough money and on the other hand you can learn a lot of Torah. So it was basically the ideal that his family was aiming for. He was known as a genius from a very young age. And in the right page of 15, he married with the daughter of a local, uh, the local gvir, the local rich man of the, of the shtetl. And it is because it was still, it, it is old school back then. So if you are a Torah scholar, you would be married to the daughter of the rich man of the, of the city. I mean, that was just the way things were. So if you were rich, you'd go to the yeshiva, or you'd go to whoever you know that is, and you'd ask who is the most uh, skilled young person learning Torah, and you'd marry your daughter to him. Uh, and so they were married at, Gil, at the age of 15, And as was the custom back then, the father-in-law supported them for, I mean, he was committed to supporting them for years. And that would enable him to sit and to learn Torah. He was active in trading. Uh, he was trading in Pishtan. How do you say Pishtan? Silk. Silk. Yes, or cotton. Uh, so he was, he was trading in, in, in textile, yeah, linen. Uh, but it is obvious from the story we'll tell in a few minutes that really his business uh, was uh, was really relying on his father-in-law money. So he was doing business, but it was all with his father-in-law money. Uh, and all of that was very nice. So for three years, he remained to learn by himself. So he developed a real independent character as a, as a Torah scholar. That is very important for the future. Uh, so he's, and in the age of 18, he goes to Volozhin. 
that is very unique, because usually you'd go to Volozhin as a 16 years old guy, not married, and you would land there and, and live from the stipend that they would give you in the yeshiva. He went there at the age of 18, married, so I guess he, did, he, he, lived, he rented a house, I would guess, in, in Volozhin, and he didn't live from the stipend of the yeshiva. He lived from his father-in-law and from his own trade. So he was, as I said, he was very independent. Uh, and he was being, he was given a smicha by Reb Yitzhak of Volozhin, the son of Reb Chaim of Volozhin, so a very prestigious smicha. And uh, everything was beautiful until, as uh, happens from time to time, his father-in-law died. Now... <laughs> That was very sad for him, for him, because as I said, really all of his business relied on the money of his father-in-law. In law, and it seems that it's not only that the father-in-law died, but also the whole business uh, completely crashed down, and so he had no money anymore. So he had no other choice but to take upon himself being a rabbi, which is the worst choice one can. But that, that's what could he do? Uh, so. Uh, he, he began as a rabbi in this very small state in Halivukia, uh, Halivok, I guess, and uh, he, he remained there for two, three years. And as was the meaning of many rabbanim back then, I think to this day, they would begin a, a, a shtel in a small shul or a small city, and then they would be upgraded to a slightly larger shul or city, and then to a slightly larger, slightly larger. And, and until they would be, if, if he's, they are skilled enough, I mean, some of them would just remain as rabbis of small places. But, uh, but uh, Gionim, like our hero, usually would climb the ladder till they would become the rabbis of a, of a big place, a big city with a nice salary, and also with an ability to have a real impact on the Jewish world, and that is basically what happened with Rav Shmuel Mohaliver. So I would give you the names of the cities, maybe some of you would know, so many, many cities, but uh, the important of them are Sobalk, uh, that is from 1860 to 1868, Radum, which is from 1868 to 1883, and the largest one of them, and where he had uh, settled down, was Bialystok, which is very well known from 1883 to 1898, uh, in which he died. <clears throat> now, there is a story which is being told by Yehuda Leib Maimon. Yehuda Leib Maimon uh, was a very interesting person. Uh, he was a, a politician. Uh, he was a rabbi. He was an historian. He was many, many things. And he, if I remember correctly, he personally met uh, Reb Shmuel Mohaliver. And... This is the shoot, the responsa, responsa volume that was printed by Musada of Cook. It was printed years ago. That's a new edition. Uh, 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 a responsa volume of Reb Shmuel Moaliver. And he wrote the introduction. In the introduction, he writes, I was not able to verify it from any other source, but he writes that Reb Shmuel Moaliver at some certain point in his career was able to win the lottery, the Polish lottery. And he won 20,000 rubles, which was a, a, a huge amount of money, I meaning the average salary of a rabbi was 600 rubles a year. So that is like, uh, help me, 30 years of work. So, so that's, uh, it's, very, it's, it's very respectful, uh, a, a very big sum. And that allowed him to become, again, independent. As he liked, he remained a rabbi, but it allowed him to remain independent of his body body, which is very important for a rabbi uh, to be able, if you want to say, you know, that's my line, you take it, or I leave, yeah, that's, and that's fine with me. Uh, so he was able to say that, and we will see that he used, used, used the, the money for, for good purpose. It was because, also because of his upbringing, it was important for him always, he didn't like to be a schnorrer. And uh, as I said, he was not being, uh, he was not being raised to become a rabbi. He was raised to become a, a businessman and he always wanted to live uh, or to, to continue this tradition. Even if he's a rabbi, at least he should not be a beggar. Uh, so it was important for him. And uh, he was, uh, he, he continued his work uh, as, a, as a trader, but he was not, as you can imagine, he was, uh, uh, he was mainly working as a rabbi. 
So he was a partner of, a, of an agricultural project, uh, raising, growing cotton, uh, or silk, or linen, or whatever they were growing there. But what is, what is important is that he had some relation to agriculture. That would also be important as our story would develop. In 1854, there was one of the Polish rebellions against the Russians. Uh, so the Polish were not happy with being subjected to the Russians, and they tried to rebel. It happened several times, and unfortunately for the Polin Polish, it didn't end well. Every time they tried to rebel, they were squished by the Russians, and also they lose some of the rights, some of the liberties, some of the freedoms. And that's uh, that's what happens when you, I guess, when you when you deal uh, with uh, with Russia. And uh, and in, so in 1854, they were rebelling. Now, for the Jews, it was very complicated because who do you support? You have your neighbors that are now in open rebellion against the occupiers. So you want to identify with your neighbors because you don't want to raise anti-Semitism. On the other hand, if the Russians would win, you really don't want to become their target of anger. So what do you choose? So most of the Jews or of the rabbis just try to keep profile very, very low. And, and shave the altase. Just, diff, just don't do anything to the uh, uh, extent possible. And as a result, as you can imagine, they were blamed by both sides as traitors. And that's, I mean, that's part of, of being in Galut. Uh, just imagine, uh, it was not so, there were not so many Jews in uh, in America in the time of the rebellions against the British, but some two thousand, I think two thousand Jews more or less. Uh, what would what side do you pick? I mean, the Jews didn't really have any problem with a taxation without uh, presentation, right? That, that mean they were doing in 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 the in America very very in the colonies very very good relating to any other place on earth. So they were very happy with the British. Who knows what would happen if the government would change? On the other hand, you have your neighbors uh, revolting. So what, what what side would you pick? It's it's very complicated. These are very complicated questions. And, and now, as I said, in America, there were a few thousand Jews. Uh, but in, in Poland, there were millions of Jews. So who do you support? That's, it's, a, it's a big question because you are a real force. Now, he chose to uh, support the Russian side. And that, in A, he gambled on the winning horse, which was important. And B, he got a medal from the Tsar for being loyal. That enabled him later in his life to open many doors. Also, he was able to save the life of many Jews. There is one very... A dramatic story, which I guess is correct because it appears almost everywhere, and that is that there were two Jews that were part of the rebellion against the Russians, and the Russians were able to capture them, and they jailed them, and they were about to execute them on the eve of Yom Kippur. And he went to the local police chief and asked him to wait because Yom Kippur is very important for the Jews and it's like uh, it would be their last wish and the ability to uh, 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 atone for their sins. So let them live for Yom Kippur and I am a hero of the Russian government. I assure you that they would come back at the end of Yom Kippur and the, the chief of police was not very happy. But in the end, he was willing to go along with that. And the, now these two were davening in the shul, and you can only imagine, right? What a good Russia you can give if you have two people before Netan Etokev, right? Mila Chaim and Mila Mavet. That's that's the the dream of any rebbe. Chas v'chalila. I'm I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> but, but yeah. So so they were davening there for the Yom Kippur, and uh, obviously it was a very devastating Yom Kippur. What was funny is that, I mean, there are two versions of the story, I would give the more dramatic one, okay. uh, and that is that the Polish rebels were able, on the Motze of Yom Kippur, to get rid of the Russians in the city. And, and the police ran away, and these two Jews were able to escape, and that was, according to the other story, the chief of police just, the other was just uh, after two days, he decided that he, that he would not, he's not willing to kill them. 
But uh, so that's very interesting. But according to this version, he was able to save those five just by being loyal to the Russians. Uh, so that's an interesting story. And it already shows you that he was not the type, as I said, to sit it down and wait. He would pick a side, he would make a choice, and he would go along with it. And that would be a, a, a characteristic of him uh, during his life. Now, in uh, 1868, as I said, he came to Radom, which was already a very big city, and he became the rabbi there. Now, he was, uh, he was a very firm person, very firm person, very stringent. I mean, in his secret to others, when he was ruling to others, that's, that's the old school. Right? When you rule to others, you try to be as lenient as you can. But to yourself, you are very, very, very stringent. And that was the type of person. He was very machmir. And he was as Litvak as they come. Right? He was a, a Litvak, son of Litvaks. He was a bit nugget. And uh, he was, he was a, a product of Volozhin. And, and the Hasidim in Radom, they saw him and he was such a... So if you saw the picture I sent, he was a, a, a Jewish looking Jew. So a, a very rabbinical looking rabbi. So they wanted to make him a rabbi. And he tried to evade them, but one Shabbat, they just came and they knocked on his door for, for Shalasidus and they sat and they, asked, they sang and they asked him if he can say Edvar Torah. Mm-hmm. And it happened for a few Shabbat in a row and he saw that he cannot, he cannot shake them away. Yeah. So what he did was he asked for the next Shabbat, he asked his wife to sit next to him in the table. The Hasidim saw that and they ran away as from fire. And that was the end of his uh, of his Rebbe career. <laughs> so it's, it's an interesting, yeah, it's an interesting story. Uh, so he, he did not become a Rebbe, but he was a, a genius. He was a very great Talmud Chacham, and uh, he was answering many true. I mean, he was uh, he was a great Talmud Chacham. He was a great Talmud. Now he lived in the same era as Rabbi Yitzchak Elchanan Spector. We spoke about that Shiur, and Rabbi Yitzchak Elchanan Spector was the known uh, authority in the all of the you would say of the Russian. Uh, uh, area, so I wouldn't say that Reb Shmuel Mohaliver became the foremost authority, but he was very meaningful. In the second row, we would say, he was up in the opening line. Uh, a very important Rav. And from this position, he made something that was very unusual. I think I already mentioned in last Shiurim that in Russia there was a big dispute between the Jews how much should we teach in the Hadarim, in the schools? How much should we teach general studies, the, the Russian language? And the, the Maskilim, and in Russia, Maskil didn't necessarily mean, and usually didn't mean someone that is an atheist. It meant someone that is from, is keeping mitzvot, maybe moderate in keeping mitzvot, keeping mitzvot, but wants to have a general knowledge and basically believes that if we would just be more a little more Russified, and you'd have a better life in Russia. It was extremely naive, but they saw themselves as the people of the big world. And yes, if we would just be a little more like them, they would accept us. It was the belief uh, in the 50s, in the 60s in Russia. And the, the Frumi Frumi said, no, no way. We are not changing the Hadarim a bit. And we would continue, I mean, not only not teach any general studies, that's out of the question, but we would continue to have the same primitive system of beating the children and nothing that is organized. So it was very, very polarized. As I, I'm sure that you would not believe the Jews can be polarized around something, but yeah, but it did happen. It did happen. So, uh, so now there were Arguments go back and forth in the newspaper of the time. You had these periodicals that would appear. It was in Ivrit, and they were mostly controlled by the Maskilim. So the editors were usually Maskilim. But you'd also had one, like a Mishpacha, a type of magazine. And that was, uh, it was called Halevanon. And it was, it was not printed in Russia. It was printed in Germany by the Orthodox rabbis of Germany. And rabbis would write to this Halevanon and I mean, it's very long articles. Uh, I tried to put some quotes from there, but it's extremely long. I mean, going around and around in circles. So I left it be. Uh, there was an argument about this question of how much general studies should we have, limu de chol, should we have in our schools, in the Hadarim. And Reb Shmuel Moraliver came very strong in favor of teaching the Russian language 
in favor of teaching mathematics, in favor of teaching children what we would call today economics. Now remember that he came from a family that believed that one should be able to sustain himself through his war. It is more he accepted the critique of the Maskilim, that the Jews in Russia were much, way too much involved in Lufthansa Geschäft, in just trading from one to the other. And he said that is, he was, it's very interesting, he was very much against trade. He said we need to be productive. I said he had a, a, a partnership in this farm, agricultural farm. He said we must try to be productive because working in, in trading from one to another, that invites uh, uh, dishonesty. I, I apologize. I hope that I'm not insulting anyone. I'm just repeating what he says. But he said, if you are producing something and you sell what you produce, it is very honest. I mean, you can still lie and cheat, but it is basically a, an, an honest occupation. If you buy from one cheap and you sell to the other expensive, it can be done honestly, but it is a, a profession that is very suspicious. It's very open to criminal minds. Uh, so he, and that was a very masculine thing to say, <laughs> because that's a very general critique of Jewish society. He was very much against teaching the children uh, Torah, Torah, Ner Torah, as they called it, Nar Torah, Nar Torah, just Torah. So no, because they would not be able to sustain themselves. And again, they you would be sending people to the world. Some of them can become Rabbanim, but how many can become Rabbanim? How many Rabbanim do we need? And you are sending the children to the world without the ability to sustain themselves, which is fair. So he said we must... Now, that was a very unusual position for a Rav in his stature. In Russia, very, very, very unusual. A bit like Arkhanan Spiktor, about whom we spoke last week, he was the proponent of not changing anything, keeping everything as it is, having very small, minor uh, 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 what it called reforms. But uh, but even that, when we saw when he saw that every opening is immediately used by the maskilim as a gap from which they can they can pour in, they said no. So we have no change at all. We just remain as we have been. Rav Mohali was of a very different position, and he, by that, he acquired many friends, both in the Maskilic world and in the Rabbinical world, because rabbis that were not, that didn't have the courage, I would say, to uh, express their opinions, they saw him as their hero. And again, he was not dependent on a salary, he was not dependent on what other rabbis think of him. If you want to lay me off, I am fine. I'm fine. So he was of a very independent making, and he had the ability to express this independence. Because sometimes you have people that are independent in their minds, but they are dependent in their lifestyle. So they are being blocked by their dependency. Sometimes you have people that are independent by their lifestyle, but just they, they are not the they are not the independent uh, uh, character. So again, they would not be independent. But he had both. He did independent character and also the means to carry and to express his views. Uh, so he was, uh, and he spoke very, very strongly, he said the people that are blocking the ability of our children to learn Russian in Russia, they are, he said, they are criminals because they cause our next generation to become, uh, to become villains because they, what, what can they do? They have no other way. Uh, so th that's, it was quoting a Gemara. The Gemara says, if a father does not teach his son any profession, then he's teaching him to be a criminal. That's what the Gemara says. And the Gemara asks, why, why do you mean he didn't teach him a profession? He didn't say to him, go steal. The Gemara says the same thing. If you do not teach him how to sustain himself, what do you expect him to do? Of course that he would go to steal. So that's a, that's a, a very strong position uh, that he carried through his life. Now, uh, what is interesting is that although he had a very extreme views, in the end, what did he call to do? He said, let's have a rabbinical, uh, a rabbinical uh, convention in which we, we would decide how reforms should be done. Because he had a very national view. 
He thought that he didn't want only to open a school in the city that he's uh, residing in. He wanted to have a whole change in Russian Jewry. But this, I mean, such big dreams sometimes have the tendency to fail themselves because there was no way that he would be able to recruit the, the other rabbis in the Russian Empire to support his positions, so nothing came out of it. What did come out of it, as I said, that he became very famous for holding these positions, and he became liked by many, many people. In 1881, the Tsar is being murdered, and as I think, again, I mentioned in the earlier shiurim, although the Jews had nothing to do with it, uh, they were blamed because they were easy target. So they were blamed and there were programs all over Russia that were supported by the government. They claimed that they did not. But uh, we have nowadays clear testimonies that the government was uh, supporting, arranging, and telling the police not to intervene when these programs were happening. And, uh, and that was devastating Thousands were murdered, thousands were raped, uh, houses were burned down, very, very, very violent. And uh, as I mentioned in the earlier shiurim, Jews were, that's the 1882, Jews begin to run away, usually to the United States, but also to Western Europe and to many, many other places. And, uh, and, and the question is what we as rabbis should do. So Rabbi Trakhan Inspector, as I mentioned last week, he was trying to stop the immigration. He wanted the Jews to remain where they are and try to solve the problem, tough it out, try to solve the problem where it is. Uh, Rabbi Mualiver was of a different opinion. And in 1882, he is publishing a, a public um, announcement, a call kore, as it was called, in source Gimel. He says, Now he's writing it together with two other very famous rabbis of the time. One is Rabbi Yosef Alevi Dov Soloveitchik, the Beit Alevi, and the other is uh, Rav Chaim Eliyahu of Lodz, who's also very famous at the time. And he says, that, they say there the following, the necess necessity brought us that we must say a few things, according to our opinion, that are needed. It is not nice for us to see what is happening with our uh, communities. Everyone is going away. Uh, so some are walking, some are running, some are scattering. No one remains in his place. And when you ask them, where do you go? And they tell you, you understand, it says they go from from bed to walls. Why? Because from Russia, they go to America. America pnei muadot. What would they find in this golden Medina in America? They say there is anti-Semitism in, in America as well. But what? In America, the Jews do not show themselves as Jews. They walk as goyim. And it's basically the truth in the middle of the, in the second half of the 19th century. So you say the anti-Semitism is not apparent there because no one can recognize if you are a Jew or not. But it's not the lifestyle that we are looking for. So, and then you had, they say, uh, it is better even to remain in Russia than go to a place in which you cannot live as a Jew. But if you do want to live, and here he says something very interesting, uh, if it is correct to ask for a refute, a refuse to the uh, Jews that are, are, are being hit and beaten, there is only one way. It's 1882, and they encourage Jews to go to the Ottoman Palestine under the government of, uh, of the Sultan. And he says, <laughs> hmm? <laughs> don't just run there. You should invest mind and you should do the calculation. So what do you do? So try to find some like-minded people and arrange at least 10 people. Everyone should give 1,000 rubles which is, as I said, that's a, that all of your saving, basically. 
And with that, יבנו קרקע, תקנו קרקע, ויבנו בתים, ויכינו כלי מחרשה, ושברים, ופרות, וצאן. The why is that? That's outstanding. Why? Because they don't tell people, go to Yerushalayim, sit there in the coil, that's what, that's what we do in, in Eretz Israel. We go to Yerushalayim, we sit in the coil, and we get money from the Chalukah, from the charity, charity coming from overseas. He says, no. That's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to collect money, go organize. Not like people are going to America, just throwing themselves. Hopefully something would happen. Be organized and create these communities and go with money and buy land and prepare yourself to become farmers. So that's the influence of Shmuel Mohaliver. Because Rabbi Yosef Doba Levi Soloveitchik, who is also signed on this petition, he would remove his signature very quickly when you'd understand what Zionism is about. But right now, that's a very unique voice. Unfortunately, as you know, it was not really answered by the Jews in Russia. I don't have the percentage right now, but I would guess that at least 97% went to Western Europe or to, to America. We speak about millions, two millions, if I remember correctly. From 18, if you take from 1880 to 905. So you have two uh, uh, million living in Russia. How many came to Israel? A few thousands. A few thousands. So do the calculation. But you have to remember a specific time in Russia because Haskalah started in Russia. It's approximately this time. That's right. And people, a revolution, 905 and that, and people... As I said, some, some Jews believed, that. some Jews believed that if we only Russiafikai a little, then they would become equal, <laughs> equal right citizens. And the yeah, the well, we know we know how it ended with this ended. Uh yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, it's very easy in history to have hindsight and uh, and to look back as everyone there is silly. But uh, it's very difficult. You, you only think about the challenges that we are facing now. What is the right way to turn? It's, this is a very difficult question to answer if you do not know the future. Anyhow, uh, so that was in 1882. As a result of that, there was established uh, an organization called Hovavay Tzion, which is basically the proto-organization of what would become the Zionist movement. It was not called yet Zionist movement. Herzl is yet to appear, but Chobev Zion are about having an organized settlement in Eretz Israel. Petach Tikva is being established, and we begin to smell the, uh, to wake up and smell the coffee, right? We begin to understand that it's time to come back to our homeland. Now again, don't raise the flag yet, because we speak about very, very few Jews in a sea of emigration from Russia, but, uh, but it's a beginning. It's a beginning. The problem is that uh, the Jews are Jews. And that means, as I said earlier, that they would have different opinions regarding everything possible on earth and beyond earth. And, uh, and not only that, they would fight about it. And you have, as part of Chovei Tzion, people that were part of Haskalah, and not necessarily that they were completely irreligious. Some of them were. Some of them, most of them were moderate, meaning they, they were religious to a degree, and they, were, they wanted Haskalah to a degree. And some were Haredim, what we call today Haredim. And the question was, can you have, because if you really want to have the uh, resources to get serious about making Aliyah, you needed everyone on board. Can you have everyone on board? That was the question for the next 30 years. And uh, I mean, I, I don't think that I'm giving anyone a spoiler now. That is, unfortunately, they were not able to do so. They were not able to do so. But that was the life project of Shmuel Mohaliver. He was, he became the Nesi HaKavod, the honorary president of the Chovev Etzion movement. The other, the Mankal, how do you say, the CEO, was a, a, a guy named Pinsker, and that was uh, not so religious. And they were both representing these different heads, 
And the question was, would they be able to work together? And would they be able to bring, each one was supposed to bring his side to the table? So Jews would begin to move en masse to Eretz Israel. It was extremely, extremely difficult from both sides because the Orthodox didn't want to cooperate with people that are uh, not religious. How can we give our hand to Ilul Akodesh, to the secation, the sacredness of the, of the Holy Land? How can it be? So we must oppose any man that would come to Eretz Israel and would not keep Torah and Mitzvot, and of course not keep Torah and Mitzvot, Nusach, Nusach Tzfar, right? In, according to exactly our understanding, Torah and Mitzvot should be kept. And uh, and on the other hand, many of the more left-wing people didn't, not only that they wanted not to keep Torah and Mitzvot, they opposed that Torah and Mitzvot would get representation. They said, you can be the tea at your home, but please do not force the public sphere to have any religious signs. I thought today was... I, well, you, know, you see that nothing is new under the sun. Nothing is new under the sun. The difference is the following, that back then you had a few millions of religious Jews and much, much fewer unreligious Jews. And if Rav Shmuel Mualiver was able, I don't blame a minute, he was trying his best, but if he was able to bring the Hasidim and the, 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 the Mitnagdim on board, then the non-religious sects would have been disappearing in, in, in numbers-wise. Uh, because that, that means we speak about, what, three millions of religious Jews, if they would have made Aliyah. Just think about the concept. Think how our life, our world now would have been changed if he was successful in, in the mission that he took upon him. I mean, he was successful to a, to a degree, but if he was successful in realizing the dreams. But this, this would be uh, almost impossible at that time because these religious Jews have to, should be accepting some concept of uh, not religion. They have to work. <laughs> this is a big problem. He was trying to, ad to, to, to advocate that working and being religious are not only they do not contradict, they are really should be one and the same. It's intolerable. It's, it's difficult. It's difficult. It was difficult. Uh, it was difficult to accept. And uh, it was difficult for him to explain that if you want a modern state, a modern according to 19th century standards, but we need to learn science. And we need also, of course, you need to understand that we shouldn't stand in Galut waiting for the Mashiach riding a donkey to come, but we need to make Aliyah and, and wait to the donkey here. Uh, and all of that, for, again, for the people I'm speaking here now, may be very simple. That's what we were taught in school. But back then, the, for many people, these were unacceptable and unheard of concepts. And just having to partner with people that do not keep Torah and mitzvot was enough for a deal breaker. So Rabbi Yosef Dova Levi Soloveitchik, the Beta Levi, immediately uh, retired, as I said, from the from 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 moving on with uh, Rav Oliver and became a bitter opponent of Zionism. That's a, that's just the truth. He became a bitter opponent of Zionism. And Rav Shmuel Oliver was he was threatened. He got letters of hatred. Now, again, he was very independent, so he didn't, uh, he, he carried it all. He had a very thick skin also. He carried it all. And he did his best in order to try to recruit resources and begin the project, hoping that if we begin the project, people would join. So he made a journey in 1882, again, it's summer of 1882, he began a journey to Western Europe trying to recruit money. And that was even more difficult because uh, people didn't want even people with money that were willing to contribute to Jewish causes, they said, your cause is a fantasy. We are, Baron Ginsburg was willing to contribute for creating Jewish settlements in Argentina, but not in Palestine, because this is, this is a, a hole in the end of the desert. Who would come here? And the Turks don't want us there. And, uh, and, and, uh, call Israel Haverim. Uh, these are the aliens. From France, they were willing to support Jews going to America. 
it's a western advancing country they didn't want Jews going to 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 the to the Levant right to the Middle East because they were French and uh, and he was he found it very difficult to to recruit money and people would offer him he would go to some rich person and, and he looked very respectful and uh, the, the again so this rich person would not want to contribute to the cause but he would say I would pay you your expenses for the road. Rabbi Moaliver made it a point. He t- didn't take a nickel for his own personal expenses. He said, Baruch Hashem, I have the money, and I am not working for myself. They say that there was one gvir that he said it to him, and immediately the gvir said the Sheikh Yanu. And, and Rabbi Moaliver asked him, why did you say Sheikh Yanu? It's the first time I meet a rabbi that doesn't take money to himself. Uh, so... Uh, but it was humiliating, as you can guess, and very, very wearing. It was all worn down. To, to Eretz Israel, he made a visit. I would speak about that, Bezot Hashem. Uh, in the end of the journey, it was almost completely. Uh, uh, it was almost completely desperate. He came to uh, Paris, to France, and the Rav of Paris was called Rabbi Tzadok Kahan Kohen. And this Reb Tzadokan uh, arranged a meeting with some young baron. And this young baron that you all know as Baron Rothschild, uh, Ed, Binyamin, Binyamin Edmond de Rothschild, I had another few names that I, I can't remember right now. But uh, basically, Binyamin Edmond de Rothschild uh, was named, uh, was known later as Anadiva Yadua, right? The, the famous uh, generous. Uh, so he, he met him. And he was able to win wow. Baron Rothschild. Uh, and Baron Rothschild, he said to him, I don't want your money. Is that what Rav Moaliver said to Baron Rothschild? I don't want your money. I want your soul. Uh, that was the sentence. Mm-hmm. And uh, and Baron Rothschild was, I mean, he took the ride. He, he decided that he's on. And he wrote, in the next few years, well, not few, in the next decades, Baron Rothschild would pay millions donate millions, not in our time's money. Back then money, I don't know how billions it would be in our, I don't know how to convert the currency. So he would write check after check after check after check. And the relationship between Rav Moaliver and, and Rothschild was not a simple one. Because Rothschild saw him as responsible. You spoke with me, so you are responsible for everything that happens in the settlements. And Rothschild was not always happy with what was going on in the settlements. And he was he was a very unique man. Again, he was very generous. I think that we should, he should be held in the past. But he was, he is, is a very important man in Shiva Zion, in our coming back to Earth Israel. And we should, I think we should pay him highest respects. But he was a very unique person uh, with, with his, uh, you know, with the uniqueness of unique people. And uh, and he was not an easy person to work with. I think that we, we are allowed to say that we, that you respect. And he made Rav Oliver's life miserable. He would write him letters. I thought you are a serious man. Now I see you are a beggar as, as, the, as, the, as all of them. In one letter he wrote to him, uh, you are, all fault is on you. <laughs> he wrote him. All fault of all, everything that happens now is, is on you. Uh, very difficult letters to the extent that they say, that's the story. They say that Rav Oliver asked when he was buried, he asked that the letters from Rothschild would be put under his head. And they asked him why. He said, when I would go to the Olama Elion, and they would say, you have such and so a so you need to go for purgatory, right, to get purged before going to Ganeda. I would say, I was already purged in this world, showing <laughs> the letters. Uh, so that's uh, that's the extent. But as I said, he, was, he had a thick skin, and he believed in the goal, and he was willing to take it on his back. And the first settlement that was created by the help of uh, Baron Rothschild was Kron, known today as Maskeret Batya. That is after the mother of, uh, of Rothschild. It's called Batya Rothschild. So Maskeret Batya. Later it was Zichon Yaakov. Uh, Zichon Yaakov, that's right. Hadera, Gadera. Ma- many places. Many places that were established by Rothschild. Again, it's not only that he wrote a check in order to buy the land. He supported them for years, for years, that the settlers needed his help before they would be able to stand on their own feet. So that was, uh, he created 
the, 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 the initiation of the new settlements here in Eretz Israel. And Moaliver was the engine behind everything that Baron Rothschild was doing. It's a, it's a fascinating story that I think, well, we don't have the time now to go into the history of the settlement in Eretz Israel. And why is it that it's clear to everyone now that the Jewish state was created by, by the seculars? As I said now, it's not so simple. All the first settlements, Petah Tikva and Maskeret, all of them were by very religious people. Now, things happened. It's not for nothing that the concept now is that this land was built by, by the Chilonim, by the Freyr people, by the, by the secular. I mean, things did happen. Uh, but as I said, the, 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 how would they say, the stick was in our hand. And we had to run with it. And it fell. We dropped the ball. That's, that's, uh, that's just the basic truth. But Rav Oliver was trying his best that as many religious Jews would make Aliyah already back then in the 1880s. Now, the difficulties were many. The Russians were not happy with the Zionist activity. Uh, as I said, that's the, the, the sickness of anti-Semites. They, they want the Jews out, but when the Jews go out, and you're traitors, you're going out. So they were not happy with, uh, with the Jews going out, especially not to the Ottoman Empire. Because that was the enemy of Russia. If you are going to the West, that's one thing. But if you are going to the Ottoman Empire, then you are joining the enemy. The Ottomans also didn't want the Jews coming because A, they were Muslim and they didn't want so many Jews flooding Eretz Israel. And B, they also saw the Jews as Russians. So this is the enemy trying to infiltrate, infiltrate our lines. So that's, uh, again, the Jews are in the courses as, as always. So that was very difficult, and the Gvirim were not really helping a part of Rothschild that was basically been calling everything. Uh, so all of that was very, very difficult, and the Jews were constantly fighting. The Orthodox against the less Orthodox, or the non-Orthodox, and the Maskilim against those who are against the Scala. And then you had the issue of Ayashan, right? You had the Jews here in Israel that were in Yerushalayim, and they thought the whole thing is complete. Jews coming to Israel and settling the land and walking the land, that's, a, that's ridiculous. It's not ridiculous. It's a heretic. So it was uh, an uphill battle. Now, they, they were able... Hmm? No, but uh, on top of that, I, I think it's a certain blame have to be on rabbis, because on, on opposite rabbis, because uh, we consider them felony at that time, but I think like Ben Gurion and uh, Begins, they were much more re religious. That many religions they know about Judaism and religion and everything, and that's why they blame them. You know, like felony, but they weren't like felony like we expect today. Days felony. I I, I agree. It's uh, but it's different times. It's different times. You have to understand. It's the time in which. Uh, the orthodoxy is losing Jews by, again, by the millions. The new generation, you have, I don't know, in some places, 70% are not keeping Torah and mitzvot. So the rabbis were on the defense. And when you're on the defense, you do not risk. You do not take risks. So they were on, a, they felt that they need to close and they need, as, as the Haredim, many of them feel to this day. Uh, they need to close themselves in order to defend. And I, I wouldn't I mean that's a that's a choice that it's easy for us to criticize, but uh, but it was a choice they made. And Rav Oliver found himself in a very difficult position, as I said. Uh, in uh, so uh, there are many dates here that I can I can mention. In 1884, there was the Katowice Convention uh, in which the Chobevich Zion really began their program and almost immediately were closed by that. It was very, 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 very difficult. Uh, he was doing his best. I mean, that was, I think, most of his energy was, A, to watch it in order to appease him that he would continue to write the checks for the whole operation, and B, to try and make peace between the, the, the religious and the non-religious uh, 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 sects. Uh, and he was trying. No, he was he was he was shooting all the guns that he had. So to the religious, he said, "You know, it's not as irreligious as you think. They are living in the land. You know, also in Russia, some people do not keep Shabbat. 
And, and you need to know that some come to Eretz Israel because of the holiness of the land. They, they do tshuva. Now, I'm not sure to what extent uh, this is what, what he wanted to think and to what extent that's really what was happening on the ground. But he was doing in be his best and he tried to explain to them in, uh, in very simple words. He said, when the house is on fire, you cannot check the identity of the one that comes to save you. The, our house is on fire. Russia is on fire. And we need to save ourselves. And going to America is not the solution. That's what he thought, at least. The solution is to go to Eretz Israel. We won't be able to do it alone. And we need to, uh, to, to hold hands. These arguments took him to a certain extent. But, uh, but again, we know uh, the final outcome. We know the final outcome. Uh, as long as he was alive, the Chobbe Zion still existed. And, but many, many rabbis uh, had uh, parshu. How do you say parshu? Uh, no, no, se 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 but, uh, yeah, separated themselves from the organization because they felt uh, that the settlements, the, col as they call the colonies, uh, are not keeping Torah as they should. And there was the whole Shmita uh, question. Rothschild was vehemently opposing keeping Shmita. He felt that he would... Uh, yeah, in the, his organization, his kidim, if you want, is the, the people on the ground that represent. I think that that's, that would be fair enough. The people that represented Rothschild here in Eretz Israel were very opposed to keeping Shmita, uh, meaning just not walking the ground. They said, "How can it be that we would continue to write checks to people that are batlanim and are not willing to walk?" Because they always suspected the Russian Jews to be a, a, a group of batlanim, of idol uh, sitters that are doing nothing. So every time, you know, today is Shabbat, today is Pesach, today is Pesach, Shani, and they suspected the whole thing. And they, they, many of them, the, meaning the, these uh, idim, these uh, officials of, uh, of Rochid, they were not religious. No, not only they were not religious, they were complete amartim. They were ignorant. They knew nothing. Uh, so they just felt that these Russian Jews are making up holidays all the times in order not to walk. And, uh, and then they came with this idea that the whole year, <laughs> talking the whole year. So they, they were not willing to hear about it. And, uh, and uh, Moaliver came with this idea, it was not his only idea, but uh, the idea, he supported the idea of Eter Mechira, of selling the land to an Anjou in order to be able to walk. But not all of the settlers were happy because they felt uh, it's not uh, strict enough. But Rothschild said, if you are not working, again, Rothschild or his officials, if you are not working, no, no money would be given. And they were completely dependent on his money for, for, for food, for medical supplies. And uh, this was very a very tough year for some of the settlers. And again, the old issue used it in order to see to say, you see how unreligious the whole new project is. They even force people to break the shmita. Uh, so again, these are these are long stories uh, that I am trying to to squeeze into very into a very narrow space. Uh, in 1890, he visits Eretz Israel and he's very happy what he sees. He says, it's only six years from where we began, and already you see settlements, you see houses, you see trees, you see things are growing. And he was so optimistic, he wrote a whole account of his, uh, of his trip, and he sent it to all of the newspapers, and it's so optimistic, and he says, yes, and, and even the non-religious, they are chuzrim b'tshuva, and everyone can be together. Now just contribute money and come to Eretz Israel. Uh, and uh, it's really beautiful. And he says, how cannot you see? He says, how cannot you see that we were able to achieve in, in just six years what we were not able to achieve in Russia for 600 years? And, and, and you see the hand of God. Why wouldn't you come to join? And you read that and, and you want to cry because we know what happened to those that didn't come to join. Yeah. So you want to cry. But, uh, but again, history had, had its way. And people made the choices. For sure. For sure. For sure. But uh, it was very different already. Uh, in uh, so I wouldn't read it from inside. Now, if you want, you can see it. In it's all in the sources. It's all swab. Uh, in eight, 1893, 
it was already uh, it was already 69 uh, which is for this time and age it's a uh, it's very old and uh, he uh, built the Mizrahi he opened the Mizrahi movement in order to try and uh, inspire the spirit of the Fomerizion in it didn't go too much uh, back then in 1896 Herzl began to operate and he writes a letter to Rav Moal all, all, everyone knew Rav Oliver. He was very famous for being a, again, and it was not a Zionist, the word Zionist did not exist, it was a Chum of uh, But everyone knew him. So he writes him a letter asking him to join the first Zionist Congress. And uh, that was in 1897. And uh, in Basel, you know, in Basel, I, I created the Jewish state. And, uh, but Moaliver is too old. He cannot, uh, he cannot travel anymore. He sends a greeting, uh, uh, like an endorsement letter to uh, to the to the Zionist Congress and again it's a uh, it's bittersweet because he writes there he says there are two things you must remember a is that our redemption would only come through the settlement of Eretz Israel and B if you want to attract the masses of Jews you must be religious he says in your home do whatever you want but if you want to be able if you want really to have the millions from eastern europe coming to Eretz israel they need to feel assured that the project is religious but the zionist Herzl himself was willing to go with whoever would, would bring the meaning i'm sure that if rav Mo'alive or anyone else would say to him i would have the endorsements of all the rebels and the rabbis in Eastern Europe, Herzl would have the, the state as a religious state. I'm sure that he would, I mean, he thought that is of urgent importance just to create a state, and what would happen later in it, they would decide when they would have a state. That was his uh, his motto. Uh, but but Rav, Rav Moaliver was not able to gather the support. As, as I said, he was, he was already old, and he, I mean, the, the other rabbis didn't want to join, because there were non-religious people as part of the project, and the non-religious were not we're not about to disappear into thin air. So you need to work with them. And they didn't work to work. They needed want to work with the non-religious people. So they would they didn't come aboard. So they left the stage <laughs> for the non-religious. That's what happened. They just left the stage. So they were much less non-religious than religious. But the non-religious were organized, they were uh, motivated, and they acted. And they more rely on themselves, not on. Yeah, that's, it's 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 obviously part of it. In in 1898, uh, in 1898, he's also it's it's already his last days, but he's already he's also organizing. So he's organizing the first colonial bank, I mean, not colonial in, in the states, in colonial here, uh, the bank uh, bank of uh, and. He writes to them like again a motto or a, 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 a vision for the bank. It's interesting, a vision for a bank, uh, but it's a bank that is supposed to be a Zionist bank. So, yeah, he writes them his vision. He says, You must be religious uh, and you must try to be as inclusive as you can, as many Jews should come. And he died a few days after writing this manifesto, and it becomes his, it's being published as the last will. Of Rav Mohaliver, so it's a letter to a bank, but uh, but it becomes his last will, and uh, I me mean, was again he was very well respected. Even the rabbis that were against Zionism respected Rav Mohaliver because he was a genius in Torah and he was uh, and he was a very 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 firm person in his personal life. No one could say anything bad about him, uh, so he was respected and he was buried the same in, in Bialystok. And Chovet uh, Zion fell apart uh, after his death. It, the, the non-religious part became part of the Zionist movement. The religious part became the Mizrahi, uh, which was a party in the Zionist movement. But we know, well, we know what happened. Uh, they did their best. Everyone did their best. And, uh, and in 1992, uh, in 1992, almost 100 years after his death, his bones were reburied in Mosqueret Batia, uh, where he lies to this day. Uh, and uh, it's—I think it's a—it's a—it's a very moving story, as many of you identified. 
It's a story that it's not only is the, the prelude to what we live today. It's, it is what we live today. Exactly. It is what we live today. And what we need, I think, what we need to learn is, uh, uh, is his commitment to the cause even when things looked very, very, very dark and uninviting, he was still trying his best. Akadosh Baruch helped him by finding the, the Baron Rothschild, which obviously gave the whole spirit to the movement. I mean, not the spirit, maybe, but the, <laughs> the physical means uh, to the movement. And, uh, and his vision, although he was not able to realize it to the extent he wanted in his lifetime, uh, I think clearly had won the day in the end. And uh, and we are uh, it can be seen, I think, as the prototype of uh, of Zionut uh, of uh, of religious Zionism, and uh, we are in in many senses we are continuing his heritage in our institutions and in our way of life. So thank you, and what, what is interesting, you know, like everybody, everybody, Jews from Russia, like uh, we, like absolutely. If they would be absolutely indifferent to God uh -huh. and to meaning comparison, they would wind up in Rwanda. Yeah. It's not true that they absolutely not. maybe yeah. they wouldn't to such extent as everybody wants, but this is very controversial. That's what he was but, trying to, to, to say to the other rabbis, but it but didn't they, it didn't work. They were quite quite you know they desecrated the Shabbat. They, they, some of them were not keeping Gitin and Kiddushin. But and... right now, right now, okay. If uh, you know what we have, because yeah. I am reading your uh, Pining Torah, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, this uh, Malamin, yes, Halakha. 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 that's unbelievable book. It's on top of everything, it's like uh, the best Jewish humor, <laughs> the best Jewish humor. You know, like, because I read, I read to my uh, son, son-in-law that to the Arab like, you. you cannot drink uh, or eat before you pray. Yes, and it stops. If you have this, you can have coffee, but without sugar. But, but if you, have, you can have sugar, and you can add milk, and then you can add a cake, and then you can, yeah, yeah. and then you can go to a hotel and then eat yeah. the It means you know, like the same, like you said. Yeah, you consecrate Shabbos, but you do many things that is good for Jews. That's what he was trying to you know, say, but I mean, uh, but he didn't accept. Uh, again, hindsight is is twenty twenty, and for us it's easy to say that if these rabbis would no, have no, cooperated, it's, it's not easy. I can I believe this, but on the other hand, with our point of view, with her, I think that at that point many rabbis were more inclined to preserve their life. It's very sharp. I, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say, so I wouldn't want to... It's, it's, it's only, on, only their source of income. Look, I don't want next generations to say such things about me, so I, I wouldn't say such things about, about earlier generations. I don't but, know. I, I believe they did their, their what in their view was the best for uh, in they in their view was the best for the Jewish people. Some of them were wrong, but, yeah, and with with very terrible outcomes. Not not only wrong, but what you see right now, what you see right now. I I'm talking about uh, what happens, what I know in the United States. Thank, Thank you, you so enjoyed much. Enjoyed your lectures and all the talk. Thank you. You you heard about uh, New Square. Or, or no, was New, New Square? It's a if community. Interrupt. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Can we leave the setup? Yeah. 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 There is a, there is a night learning today. Yeah. yeah. And the second one. Uh, how many do you think? Uh, ah, to the, I think after Tisha Bell. No, uh, yeah, after Tisha Bell. Yeah. So yeah. so we have yeah. two more shiurim. Yeah. I don't think we'd be able to finish the 19th century. So yeah. they have to carry it yeah. on to Elu. <laughs> Yeah. It's, I know it's fascinating. I don't want to skip so important oh. things. But uh, this is new square communities that mm. came from Ukraine, and I know because it was next to my shtetl and organized. Rabbis are multi millionaire. Oh. Multi, he owns all houses in this community. Okay, again, 
I, I wouldn't want uh, I wouldn't want <laughs> not no, to yeah exactly 